Minnehaha Falls has a rich history in the state of Minnesota. In 1819, Lieutenant Nathan Clark and his wife Charlotte traveled from Connecticut to what would become Fort Snelling in Minnesota. Along the way, at Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, their daughter Charlotte was born. Charlotte spent her childhood at Fort Snelling and considered going to the falls as her favorite thing to do. She remembered how they often picked wild strawberries at the falls and how sweet they tasted. During several tours of duty in the 1830s and 40s, Seth Eastman was stationed at Fort Snelling. Captain Eastman was a skilled artist and sketched numerous views of Minnehaha Falls. Later in life, his wife Mary published several books, which included his illustrations. In 1852, Alexandra Hessler, an accomplished photographer from Chicago, traveled to Minnesota by steamboat. On August 15th, Hessler and Joel Whitney, a photographer from St. Paul, went to Minnehaha Falls. After cutting down several trees, they took 25 to 30 photographs, which are the first known photographs of the falls. Whitney owned a photography studio on the corner of 3rd and Cedar in St. Paul. Whitney would go on to take numerous shots of Minnehaha Falls himself during all the different seasons of the year. Since East Coast residents wanted to know more about the frontier, Harper's new monthly magazine sent a correspondent to Minnesota in 1853. The author traveled to Rockford, Illinois by train, Galena, Illinois by stagecoach, and up the Mississippi River on a steamboat. Let's take a closer look at his track along the Mississippi River within the Red Circle. The steamboat traveled up the Mississippi and passed by the scenic Sugarloaf near modern-day Winona, Minnesota. This was a tall bluff along the Mississippi, which stood out to boat traffic. It would go on to become another Minnesota tourist attraction. The correspondent next arrived at Lake Pepin, which is about 22 miles long and 2 miles wide. The lake is really just a natural broadening in the Mississippi River, with tall bluffs on either side. Lake Pepin also fascinated Easterners. The next spot along the journey was Maiden Rock, on the eastern side of the Mississippi River. Maiden Rock had a bare rock front and was also called Lover's Leap, as legend said a Native American woman named Winona leapt to her death there, rather than marry a warrior she did not love. This bluff along the Mississippi also became a hot spot for visitors. Barn Bluff was a little further upstream on the Mississippi River, near modern-day Red Wing, Minnesota. The town was built right next to the tall stone bluff. As the correspondent reached St. Paul, there were other popular sites to visit. Carver's Cave was just downstream of St. Paul. The cave was said to contain a beautiful lake. Photographs were difficult to take, due to poor lighting and all the water. The city of St. Paul itself was a huge attraction. As you rounded the bend in the Mississippi River, it stood out on the north side of the river. One portion of town was located along the river, while the central portion was located on a plateau, about 100 feet above the river. A beautiful view of the town could be obtained from the dome of its capital building, Panoramic views could also be found from the surrounding bluffs. Another scenic stop near St. Paul was Fountain Cave. The entrance to the cave was about 20 feet high by 25 feet wide, and it was composed entirely of sandstone. The cave was located on the bank of the Mississippi River, where a small stream flowed out of it. This was another difficult spot to photograph, but it was also a tourist draw. Pilot Knob was a sacred spot for Native Americans, as it was another prominent bluff along the Minnesota River. 
Steamboat pilots could spot the landmark and know exactly where they were. From Pilot Knob, Fort Snelling was just across the river, at the confluence of the Mississippi and Minnesota rivers. It stood on a rocky promontory of pure white sandstone. The fort had a commanding view of both river valleys. The interior of the fort had whitewashed barracks, but its most dominant feature was its tall flagstaff and American flag. For visitors, the most popular spot of Fort Snelling was its wooden tower on the edge of the cliffs. This is where the beautiful views of the surrounding territory could be obtained. Not far from Fort Snelling was Minnehaha Falls. This was a charming little waterfall in the woods, lined with rocks and trees. The waterfall became a big draw for tourists, who could wade in the shallow waters of the creek, both above and below the falls. Minnehaha Falls was dwarfed in scale by St. Anthony Falls, which was on the Mississippi River. Its natural beauty was short-lived, though, as mills and other developments quickly obscured it. After these mills were built, the banks of the river were covered with wood chips and sawdust. Logs were floated down the Mississippi River from upstream to these mills at St. Anthony Falls. The city of St. Anthony was built before Minneapolis, right next to St. Anthony Falls. It was located on an elevated prairie where it figured to be an extensive manufacturing town. This view was taken from an elevated position looking northward through town. The final attractions were located along the Mississippi River south of St. Anthony. The Silver Cascade was a small stream that flowed into the Mississippi, producing another beautiful little waterfall. Good views of this waterfall were hard to obtain due to the rugged terrain along the river. The Bridal Veil Waterfall was about a mile from the Silver Cascade. It was another small waterfall of about 60 feet. The third waterfall was called Fawn's Leap, and beautiful pictures of it could be taken below the falls. However, of all the sites between St. Paul and St. Anthony, Minnehaha Falls was the most popular. The article that appeared in Harper's New Monthly Magazine included sketches of most of the scenic spots along the Upper Mississippi. This was one of the first magazines to include illustrations with their articles. Illustrations helped to increase the popularity of Minnehaha Falls, but words were magical too. Of the falls, the Atlantic Monthly wrote, We hasten along well-worn paths, guided first by the roar, then by a pale ghost of a mist, seen rising amid the shadowy boughs, until we stand on the brink of a wooden chasm, into which pours a curved sheet of foam over a broad projecting ledge. The steep sides of the gorge are formed of broken and mossy rocks, clasped here and there by the crooked talons of overbrooding trees. As visitors and potential settlers poured into the upper Mississippi, they could get right to Minnehaha Falls by steamboat. They could also drive or ride to the area by horsepower, or eventually by railroad. Minnehaha Creek was an outlet of Lake Minnetonka, which was located west of Minneapolis. The creek wound its way east, southeast, then northeast into Rice Lake, or Lake Hiawatha. Minnehaha Falls was located about midway between Lake Hiawatha and the Mississippi River. Overall, Minnehaha Creek was about 22 miles in length. Minnehaha Falls was composed of a layer of limestone above a layer of sandstone. Due to this unstable combination, there has always been fear that the edge of the falls could break off and change its entire look. Early photographs of the site clearly showed these rock layers. Another interesting feature was the semicircular angle of the falls, shown by the orange lines. 
This is a close-up of the rock formations behind the falls. A railroad bridge was built across Minnehaha Creek west of the falls. This small bridge can be seen in the background of this photo. For visitors stopping at the falls, a small depot was built. This depot has been preserved at the falls site. A hotel was even built nearby to accommodate some of the visitors. This hotel also served meals for hungry tourists. A small bridge was eventually built above the falls to give visitors a better view. The Minnehaha Hotel can also be seen in the background of this photo. Various lower bridges were built well before the upper ones. Here are some of the lower bridges built during the early years at Minnehaha Falls. The popularity of the falls increased after 1855, when Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote the poem, The Song of Hiawatha. Although he hadn't visited the site, Longfellow wrote the poem based off Alexander Hessler's 1852 photograph of the falls. In 1856, another sketch of Minnehaha Falls appeared in Mrs. Stevens' new monthly magazine. This sketch was made by Mr. Dallas. That same year, another sketch of the falls appeared in the business directory for the city of St. Paul. Gilbert Munger, an artist living in Minnesota, made several paintings of Minnehaha Falls in the late 1860s. Munger included Native Americans in his works. About the same time, Charles A. Zimmerman began taking photographs of the St. Paul area. While taking some winter shots of the falls, a huge icicle broke off and struck him on the head and shoulders, knocking him out. Zimmerman recovered, and his ice pictures were a hit. Zimmerman took many photos of Minnehaha Falls over the years. Benjamin Franklin Upton was a photographer from Minneapolis. Upton took numerous shots of the falls, including these three. William H. Illingworth was another popular photographer from St. Paul. Illingworth also spent a lot of time photographing Minnehaha Falls. J.P. Doramus, an accomplished photographer from New Jersey, came west to photograph the entire Mississippi River in 1874. In March, he took some winter shots of the falls. Then, before departing the St. Paul area, he took additional shots of the falls in July. Elmer and Tenney, well-known photographers from Winona, Minnesota, also took photographs of the falls. Their pictures were sold extensively in eastern markets. Finally, Michael Nowak published numerous photographs of Minnehaha Falls. Nowak had galleries in both Minneapolis and St. Paul. Popularity was also a downfall for Minnehaha Falls. Photographers cut down trees, paths were worn through the area, and visitors cut into the native sandstone. Tourists carved their initials into the wooden bridges and left trash around the grounds. There were even saloons nearby. One of the first non-Native American visitors to the falls, Charlotte Clark, who had become Charlotte Van Cleve, was horrified by the changes. She wrote, Standing beside it now, and remembering it in its purity, just as God made it, my eyes are full of unshed tears. She took solace in knowing that Minneapolis and St. Paul were working to preserve the falls as a park. Those plans were finalized in 1889, allowing the falls to be carefully preserved for future generations. Minnehaha Falls is one of the most photographed sites in the state of Minnesota, with millions of visitors every year. Even when the creek is dry, the site is still beautiful.
that concludes the video. Make sure to check out my other YouTube videos and my primary website at mnbricks.com.